Can we stand to our feet one more time? Let's just give Pastor Tom Lane a big New Life Church welcome. Hey, everyone. Thank you. And thank you. Please be seated. So glad to be here. You know, uh, I met your, your pastors, Mike and Bonnie, at New Life a little over a year ago or about a year ago, and I've quickly fallen in love with them. Do you know you have a great pastoral team here? Amen? So, love and appreciate you very much, and uh, thank you. Enjoyed being here with the men. You know, I, I heard that this service was a little bit of a raucous service, and so uh, I saved a, a little funny story that I didn't share with the other services. Is that okay if I share it with you? Yeah. So I, I ran across this. It was a, a, a group of adults were taking a computer science course, and after a few weeks, the professor decided to have a little fun, and he divided the class into men and women and gave them an assignment. He gave, said, I want you to take 20, 30 minutes. I want you to discuss. I want you to figure out what the gender is of a computer. So after 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, uh, the guys went first, and they voted unanimously that a computer's gender is female for the following reasons. One, no one but their creator knows their internal logic. <laughs> Two, when computers speak to each other, they speak in a code language that only they and experts can understand. <laughs> Three, Every mistake you make is stored on the hard drive for later retrieval. <laughs> and four, as soon as you commit to one, you find yourself spending half your paycheck accessorizing it. <laughs> so, the ladies went next, and ladies voted unanimously that the gender of a computer is male for the following reasons. In order to get their attention, you have to turn them on. They have a lot of data, but they still can't think for themselves. <laughs> They're supposed to help you solve problems, but half the time, they are the problem. <laughs> and as soon as you commit to one, you realize if you'd waited a little longer, you could have gotten a better model. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Has nothing to do with what I want to share with you today but it's a little bit fun. All right, if you got your Bible uh, or however you access the Word, your smartphone or whatever, turn to 1 Kings 19 and verse 1. That in this chapter or in this part of the Word, uh, the, the prophet Elijah had confronted the, the prophets of Baal, confronted the nation of Israel about their God. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve Baal or are you going to serve God? Who, who is the real God? And he had a showdown uh, to see who could, which God would consume the sacrifice. Uh, the prophets of Baal tried all day to get Baal to respond with no, no word, no, no response. And then God uh, consumed the, the sacrifice and the prophets of Baal were killed. And we, we pick up the story there at that point in uh, chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Elijah sent a messenger to, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. <clears throat> then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down, and the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank 
and wit in the strength of the, the food, that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, if you're here today, <clears throat> a lot of times what we uh, describe, the, when we describe our life, we, we describe it in a linear fashion, sort of mountaintop to mountaintop. We, we talk about things that God has done or things that have happened in our life from a, a positive sense. But in reality, <clears throat> between the mountaintops, there's a valley. There's, a, uh, there's a, a work that is done. We experience God and the, the provision of God on the mountaintops, but we meet God, we find God in the valleys of our life. And so if you're here today and you are in a valley of life, this message is for you. If, if you're, you're, you find yourself in a, <clears throat> a situation where you've encountered some of the great things of God and you've, you've crested the mountain and you're down, heading down into a valley on your way to the next mountaintop, this message is for you. That's where Elijah found himself. He, he was afraid for his life. He was discouraged and disoriented. He had just come off of one of the greatest uh, accomplishments probably ever in the, uh, in the encounter with the prophets of Baal, and yet he was like any of us. He was filled with insecurity and fear that manifest at, at the time of his greatest depletion. Following a spiritual battle, and uh, just like us, when we're confronted with spiritual resistance. And so if you're fighting fears from threats real or imagined in your life today, or your emotions are depleted and raw, or if you've been tempted to abandon your assignment or question your call and give up on God because you've lost all confidence in yourself and the vision you once had for your life, this message is for you. I call this message the broom tree experience. And here's what you need to know about the broom tree experience. First, it's the place of self-pity and doubt and insecurity. No matter how successful we've been, no matter what we've experienced, or uh, no matter how respected we are, there are times when the weight of circumstances close in on us and make us feel alone, abandoned, and insecure. Consider what Elijah had experienced, and yet he felt these things, these self-doubt and insecurity. Elijah boldly declared God's response to sin in the nation. He said there wouldn't be, a, a, there wouldn't be rain. He, he declared it drought, and it wouldn't be broken until he declared it on God's behalf. He fearlessly confronted sin in the king when the king murdered to take Nabal's vineyard. Elijah called his sin out, and, the king, uh, and when the king and the nation tolerated the prophets of Baal, he, he challenged them to a showdown. He raised the dead uh, when the widow's son uh, died in, in 1 Kings 17. He experienced God's miraculous provision being fed morning and evening by the ravens. He experienced God's miraculous provision being hidden by God for three days uh, by the brook. And uh, yet Jezebel, when Jezebel threatened him, he doubted his position with God and he ran in insecurity. I find this to be true in my own life when I'm, when I'm challenged, when I've, when I've, when I've crested uh, a peak of experience in God and uh, my emotions are raw and the enemy attacks, I'm, I'm so tempted to run just like Elijah did, to run away. Uh, and, and here's the question I have for you, for you today, even as I ask myself. What do you do when doubt overwhelms you or when you're insecure? What do you do when, when the things that you have trusted in, believed in, that you've, you've taught maybe, it hasn't worked out like you thought? Do you lash out and become aggressive? Do you withdraw to an alone place away from people? Do you hide and deny your feelings? What God wants us to do is honest up, to be open and honest, and not run away from him, and to, to carry through. Consistency is the key. Galatians 6, 9 says, don't grow weary in doing good, for in due time you will reap if you do not faint. Elijah lays down under the broom tree, <clears throat> angry, discouraged, ready to quit. 
He's covered in self-pity. Elijah retreated into his self-pity under the broom tree and found temporary comfort. And you and I, if we retreat away from the responsibilities of life in the, in the face of the battle, we'll find temporary relief like he did from his fear and insecurity in the shade of disengagement. He took a nap. Some of us, like Elijah, are disengaged. We're napping under the broom tree. The only problem with that is the broom tree is a little scruffy tree. It doesn't provide enough comfort for long-term sustaining of our life. God uses our insecurity, our self-pity, and fear to further our spiritual development and pronounce and not pronounce our defeat. God would never use the insecurity of your life to point a finger of accusation at you. He loves you too much. It's a spiritual battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers according to Ephesians chapter 6. The broom tree is where we learn some of the most important next level lessons on our journey with God and our service to Him. We learn to direct our emotions through our commitment to God. We learn to, to how to draw our faith from God's reservoir and not our own shallow cistern. We learn the reality of Galatians 2.20, I live, I live, nevertheless, Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We, we learn to be submitted to God as we resist the devil and look for him to leave us alone, according to James 4 and verse 7. It's a place of insecurity. It's a place of of despair and loneliness. If you find yourself in that place today, it's not a place that God wants you to stay. It's a place, it, it may feel like an alone place, but here's the second thing, thing you need to know. The, the broom tree is a place of discovery, trial, and testing. He went there, Elijah went there to hide for, from fear, threat, and insecurity. He was stuck in self-pity and and personal disqualification, and he ran there in fear and desperation to quit and to sulk. But God had other plans for Elijah's wilderness experience. The wilderness leads us to personal reflection and rededication of our commitment to God. If you find yourself in that alone place under the broom tree of your circumstance today, it's a solitary place, but it's not an alone place. I want you to hear you're not alone. God is with you right where you are. It's a place to deepen your relationship with God. It's a place to contend with God over the dis disappointment and frustration that you've experienced. The wilderness was a, a path to deeper intimacy with God. The depth of relationship it, it, that we have with God is formed through discovery, trials, and testing. The broom tree is a place of, of discover, uh, discovery, our bondage, discovering our bondage and limitations uh, before God. They're exposed. We, we confront despair and overcome hopelessness, and we expose unmet, hidden expectations and disappointments. I don't know what your disappointment may be today. Maybe it's a medical uh, diagnosis that you received, or maybe it's a, a, a child or a loved one that you're, you have a broken relationship with and you have attempted to do everything you know to do and it just isn't working. You've prayed and asked God to make things right. Maybe it's a job situation. You thought you were entitled to that raise or that promotion and it, it didn't come. We discover where, where we are, the hidden expectations, the, the disappointment and despair of our life under the broom tree. Uh, discovering and dealing with, with the lies that we have embraced while we're there is what enables us to find breakthrough. We discover new aspects of our giftedness and increase our capacity to lean on God. We come to a new understanding of God's purpose or plan for our life and we see God in a whole new light in light of his faithfulness in the difficulty of our situation. It's about him living through us. We realize it's God's power, not our performance. We discover and overcome the things that are restricting and influencing our actions, and we develop the perspective we need for the next season of service. Revelation that brings breakthrough is connected with testing. James 1 and verse 2 says, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness 
or endurance. And let endurance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you need steadfastness? Do you need the ability to endure in a situation that you're in today? I believe what God is saying to you, to us, in this message is he'll provide an, 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 enduring, an ability to endure in a difficult situation. Testing in God's economy always is pass-fail. You either pass or you get to try it again. It's always open book. And so you can go to the Word and stand on the promises of God and declare the promises of God and encourage yourself in the promises of, of God and find the solution to the situation that you're dealing with in His Word. It requires faith, a belief that God is in the middle of the situation that you're in and that He is a rewarder, faithfully, diligently rewarding those who seek Him. Testing is the engine that propels our progress toward intimacy with God. So here's three things that I want to tell you about testing. If you're in a test today, don't complain and don't give up. Endure. Endurance is the product of testing. Realize that the desire to escape is normal in these circumstances and don't give it a place. Elijah, he wanted to die. He wanted to, God, just kill me. I, I find myself finding in those desperate moments, uh, I, I cry out and say, you know, just remove, this, remove me from this situation. Take me out of this. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't like it. Uh, let me fade away and someone else step into my place. And, and what God says is, no, I'm not taking you out. I'm taking you through. I'll guide you through in my faithfulness the situation that you're in so you can produce endurance. For most of my adult life, I've been a runner. I've uh, not just to stay in shape. I really wasn't a competitive runner, and people would ask me, well, what are you training for? And I felt sort of guilty, and I thought, well, maybe I ought to train for something. But really what I was doing, I'd run three to five times a week, and I'd run anywhere from three to five miles when I ran. What, what, what amazed me about running is no matter how long I had run, <clears throat> I, I was running about an eight-minute mile pace uh, in my, my runs, and it didn't matter. Didn't matter if, if I had been consistent, and diligent, and, and, and run for years. Oftentimes, when I would start out running, the first mile that I would run, my body would be telling me, you're not going to make it. Stop. Stop. You're killing us here. We, we, need, we need a rest. Give it a break, Tom. Walk. You know, maybe you're hearing those voices today in the situation of your life. Stop. Stop. Stop running. Walk. Don't. Don't apply yourself into the situation. Give up. Don't give up and don't complain. Prayer changes things. Ask for prayer. Get healthy, godly people to pray for you. We need people to pray for us who don't draw on us. We need to draw on their strength and, and their stability in times of need. Uh, also, they, they can't be people that will draw, be drawn into our offense if we share something that we're going through. They need to be above that, that offense and stand in the gap for us as they pray so that we don't give up. In a test, here's the second thing, push through the temptation to quit. God is calling you to do the right thing. The flesh and the enemy are drawing you uh, to do your own thing. And you don't need sympathetic voices. You need a solitary place to reaffirm your commitment to God. Realize you're fighting for more than yourself. Your victory will impact others for generations to come. Don't give up. Don't quit. <clears throat> Fight that temptation and know that when you, when you receive the victory, it's not just for yourself, but it's for multiple generations. Work, fight, contend to pass the test for yourself and for those you love and don't let it rule over you. In Genesis chapter 4, we're, we're, Genesis chapter 4 is the account of Cain and Abel, and they had brought an offering to the Lord, and uh, God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain's offering, and Cain had a bad attitude. Cain, it, it, he is, when we have a bad attitude, it's reflected in our actions and our attitudes and this is what was happening with Cain and the Lord comes to him in verse 6 and says the Lord the Lord said to Cain why are you angry and why is your face fallen if you do well 
will, not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary uh, to you. You must rule over it. I just say again, uh, there's, a, there's a push in these instances to quit, to give up, uh, and uh, to settle into the bad attitude, to point fingers of blame toward other people. And, and God comes and says, don't, don't do that. The, the sin's crouching at the door. Uh, don't, you must master it. Don't let it master you. Don't give up. Don't quit. And the third thing is allow endurance to be formed in you and don't grow weary. Encourage yourself with truth. God is good and he loves me. Tell yourself that and believe it. God has good plans for my life. This is a difficult situation, but God's not judging me. He's not mad at me. He's, he's not rejected me. God loves me and he has good plans for my life. Truth is, is real. Your feelings are deceptive. Lean on the truth of God's word. The situation is building endurance in your spiritual walk. And so don't, don't stop. Don't stop. Press forward and allow God's word to wash over you and strengthen you. And in times like this in my life, I love Isaiah 41.10. Because the, the discouragement of life leads us to despair. What am I going to do? How am I going to fix this? What am I going to do about this? And, and God comes and says, fear not, Tom. Fear not, because I'm with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. No matter what you're dealing with today, a job situation, a boss that, that is difficult to deal with, a medical situation in your life, a wayward child, a marriage that's in trouble, God will uphold you with his righteous hand. Don't quit. Endure. The third thing is, is this. Uh, the broom tree experience is the doorway to greater intimacy with God. The broom tree, as I said, is this little scruffy tree. It's almost like a bush. Uh, Elijah could lay down underneath it, but not for long. It wasn't an air-conditioned place. It wasn't a place of great comfort. He was in the desert. It provides just enough shade to enable us to continue. If you're in a broom tree experience, there's just enough covering, just enough relief to allow you to make the right choices to move to the next place in God. He's preparing us in the strength of his power to move on with renewed hope, with, with revelation of truth, and with the urgency of promise. The broom tree provides the resources and the strength for the journey as God encounters us in that place. He, he'll be with you if you open your life up and say, okay, God, I'm in this difficult spot and I need you today. I'm looking to you. I'm not going to run away uh, from you. You might say to me, well, Tom, how long will I be in this difficult spot? I mean, how long does the test go on? How, how, how long, what's the length of my broom tree experience? Why is it taking so long to, for me to get breakthrough? Why can't I get the revelation that I need? Well, look at what happened in Elisha's life. He ran 100 miles to Beersheba, to the Sinai Peninsula, in, into the desert to find an alone place. Maybe you've run away from the situation that you're in and you're in a lone place. Maybe you've cut yourself off from people who could help, who, who could pray for you. And uh, you're, you're 100 miles, if not physically, emotionally, or spiritually, from where you need to be. It was a 40-day walk to get back, get back to Mount Horeb where uh, the presence of God was. Just, just think about the whole idea of 40 days, the significance of of 40, it's, it, it signifies, that number signifies uh, the time associated with testing. You're in a 40 minute, 40 day, 40 hour. You, you're in some form of testing. It, it, it symbolizes testing like uh, uh, when Moses killed the Egyptian, he fled to Midian and spent 40 years in the desert. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. The prophet Jonah powerfully warned against ancient Nineveh for 40 days that destruction would come 
because of their many sins if they didn't repent. The Israelite spies took 40 days to search out Canaan. The Israelites wandered 40 years in the wilderness before Samson delivered Israel. They, they served the Philistines 40 years and Goliath taunted Saul's armies for 40 days before David arrived to slay him. I don't know what your 40 limit is, but I do know this, there will be a suddenly moment when the 40 days end. When the 40 days end and your, your trial has is over and the provision of God is revealed, the intimacy that God wants uh, is, it has, has taken place. How long will it last? Until the test is over. God is faithful. He's developing endurance in you. Let that endurance take root. Greater revelation and intimacy with God leads us to change. It resets the course of our life. And God comes to Elijah in this moment and he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing with your life? He might be asking us that today. What are, what are you doing here? Have you ever had somebody ask you that, that question and you go, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What are you doing here, Elijah? You're off, you're off base, you're off course because you believed a lie. You believed that you were the only one that was dedicated to doing my work and it's not true. You feel sorry for yourself because you're the only one. What lie have you believed that is not true that's taken you to the broom tree experience and to a deserted place? God will expose the lie and as he exposes the lie, he'll bring life into you a new, new intimacy uh, with him. God actually had reserved 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed the knee, and yet Elijah believed he was the only one and ready to die because he was the only one. Don't give up today. Don't lose heart today. God is in charge of the circumstances of your life, and if you're under a broom tree, God's intending you, he will lead you back to the place of his presence and provision in your life. Let me ask you, uh, I'm going to pray for us, but let me ask you a question. Just bow your heads if you would. This is a simple and an easy question. What, what's God saying to you today? Are you in a difficult spot? Do you need the provision of God to be worked in your life today? Are you frustrated and discouraged? Would you just open up, allow God to do his work, make a provision for you? We're gonna go back into one more song of worship. And as we do, if you need prayer, if you need to make a statement to God, you can come down here and pray. You wanna to go to the communion tables, they're available to you. We. We believe that God is present today and he's bringing deliverance and freedom and, and restoring things in, in our life. You don't have to stay under the broom tree. You can, you can stay, take the, the walk to God's presence and see his power released in your life. Can you say amen? Amen. Lord, I pray for every person in this room today, every person that's in a difficult spot. Lord, would you reveal yourself in a powerful and mighty way, a powerful way in their circumstance. And would you take them from the broom tree into the place of your presence and power to reveal yourself as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and let's worship.